It's a beautiful Sunday. Take some stuff, spires out of the shed. As you watch this, the mast you see here, most of the crew, Akiva, and the boat itself are all down in Mattapoisett, making the final preparations for launch. I wanted to let you all know that I'm going to do everything I can to shorten the gap between what you're seeing week to week so that the video of launch day comes as close to real time as I can put it together. Last weekend with the boathouse coming down and the boat moving, it was an emotional experience for everyone. It's a pretty special time for Steve and Arabella as they get ready to hit the water on June 17th. We hope you can make it there in person, and if not, I'll have a video for you in about a week if all goes right. Thanks as always for following along and everything you do to keep us all moving forward. Pivoting. Okay, going forward. Slow, 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 slow. The spars were set outside in advance of Keith Mitchell's visit back to Granby. And we'll flash back to the work he did when we set up the masts and rigging on the water. And that's also when we'll get a look at all the hours Joe has been putting in, machining new parts for all the bronze hardware aloft and on deck. Nice little core sample of the caulking as well, and the fairing compound. This looks really nice. Yeah, that actually went out farther than we thought. Okay. Gross. We got our first through hole. This feels nice and scary. Right? I... <laughs> <It's kind of scary. laughs> drill, baby, drill. <laughs> Guess this is part of normal llama behavior, huh? All right, this is great. This is a much better setting. Oh, oh, I don't want to knock that over. Why don't you sit on that? Oh, he seems kind of pissed, actually. Sit on this one. No? The worst thing to do is spit on you. It would be hilarious. Yeah, that would be pretty gross. Well, I'm Kyle. Um, I am here to sort out a lot of the fluid systems on the boat um, and I have a fair bit of experience doing stuff like this from my previous work in aerospace engineering. I'm in the middle of taking about a year-ish off of work right now and being fortunate enough to travel around and explore different parts of the U.S. and the world and this is one of those. So for about two months I'm here uh, in western Massachusetts helping to get this boat ready to float. There are a few things that won't be done by launch yeah. on the fluid system on this boat. We, we know what's required to float, um, and we know what would be difficult to install later on. So those are the two things we're working on to start with. So yeah. all bilge pumps, for instance, need to be working. Anchor locker pump needs to be working. A rudimentary freshwater system needs to be working, at very least like water maker to a foot pump, mm -hmm. um, and enough of a gray water system to use the sink. Uh, we don't need a functioning shower. We don't necessarily need functioning hot water. Um, and propane stove is not a, a strict necessity. So, And the good news about like fluid stuff in general is like you don't need a table saw or a six foot tall band saw to do it. Yeah. So it's not a huge amount more difficult to do in the boat as compared to, or sorry, to do in the boat when it's floating as compared to when it's in the boathouse. Yeah. The only thing that could make it tricky is we are installing some components that make it hard to get to fluid systems. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of thinking ahead there. Yeah. There's a lot of holes in a boat. 
Um, we have, I, I think eight or nine different through holes. Um, two are inlets, the rest are outlets. So the two that are inlets are the engine raw water inlet and the seawater wash down and uh, water maker inlet, those two share. The rest are outlets. So we have a lot of bilge pumps and things like that discharging overboard, gray water discharges overboard. And all of these, because it's a wooden boat, are a little more tricky. Um, we're going through planks that are, you know, at most about that wide and at narrowest in some cases about that wide. So we're actually removing a fair bit of structure when we punch a hole to let fluids in and out through that hole. Mm -hmm. So the through holes are not just the bronze fittings themselves, but they're also a, a wood reinforcement that goes around each of those bronze fittings yeah. that I've been making and shaping to the hole. Mm -hmm. um, those are pretty much ready to go in right now. We just need to get one more coat of paint on the hole, and then we can start gluing and riveting those in place. <laughs> We're getting all of your transition shots. So we're doing through holes today, but this is a special one. This is for the speed and depth transducer. And that has to be mounted within 22 degrees, up to a 22 degree Desbit rise angle. There's nowhere on the boat that is less than 30 degree dead rise. So we've picked a 30 degree spot and then made an inside and outside kind of wedge shaped fairing that changes the angle by about 12 degrees to get us to 22 degree or 20 degrees. So this is gonna go on here, just like this. So I'm just gonna line up my hole, put a screw in here temporarily, and then drill this for ring shank nails. Then pop it off, 4200, back on, drive the ring shank nails, and then we'll drill the through hole last. But you can see this, is the inside block drilled for the ring shank nails. Yeah. yeah, so it just goes on there like that. You can see it's the comparable angle to the outside one. Mm -hmm. So the through hole will still be perpendicular to this surface, but at a 20 degree angle to the horizon. So my goal with this fairing is to make it as you know low resistance as possible which means I kind of want to align the fairing with the flow along the hull here. And because I'm a naval architect, I should do that well. Um, <laughs> generally, when you're looking at a boat with a hull shape like this, you're gonna have some kind of upwards, you know, the flow is not just gonna be parallel to the seams here. It's gonna start coming up because it has to go down around the midship section and then it'll start to come up along the hull. So we're gonna put this a little bit above horizontal. Now we gotta figure out where to drill. I'm marking this because we're using two different lengths of nail. One and a quarter inch and one and three quarter inch because we don't want any of these nails to go completely through the planks. Two, four, six, eight, nine. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Not hitting any screws. It is possible that one of these lines up with a nail on the inside, but it's probably not gonna happen. Pretty great. He's got clearance, yeah. yeah. All right. We got clearance to drill. Uh, you want me to hop outside? Yeah. Yep. Is the counterboard drill already? It out? is out there. Yep. Sweet. I already counterboard these. Oh, you tighten the nuts, right? Yeah. All right. We're doing it.
It's not sharp anymore. Hi, Kyle. Why, hello there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is 4200, the Miracle, Miracle Glue. Fast cure, s strong, but not permanent. 5200 is the permanent one. It's on the three-star scale between removable and permanent, it's two. All right. <laughs> so we're going to put this in from the outside, then pump some more glue into the gap, put the backing block on the top, mm -hmm. push the bolts up through, put the seacock on, tighten this down, and hopefully get some good squeeze out. That makes such a funny noise. <laughs> it's really goofy. <laughs>while Satchel and Kyle punched holes in his boat, Steve got started on what he considers the trickiest piece of joinery yet. The cherry cockpit combings were getting set to be steam bent the following day and fit against the bronze support brackets you can see here. Kyle, I gotta go. You gotta go? Yeah. All right. My ride's here. Somebody else wanna help him finish the rivets? It's a tricky little curve right there. Yeah, well, <laughs> we're at the very beginning stages of the tricky curves. Yeah. Does it need a bevel on it? Like, is this gonna get cut in too, angled? <laughs> There's many processes until that bevel gets cut. Yes. It needs all the shapes, all the shapes. Slowly bending the curves in over the next few hours, Steve turned his attention to a few small jobs on deck, while Keith got this small bronze plate that will raise the bowsprit just off the deck. Steve attached the cowls to the now installed Dorade boxes.
do, pig. Oh, that no. is nice. Yeah. And we can tweak these a little bit. Can tweak that angle a degree or two, tweak that angle a degree or two. It's part of the reason I haven't put any angle brackets or anything in them. This is nine of nine. Yeah. Last one. It has been a battle. Time for the through hole. All gooped up. Oh. -ho. And here we go. Cool, threads are engaged. All right, that's pretty tight. Well, the mission this morning is to work on modifying this diesel. So no matter what engine you get, they generally stick the oil filter and the fuel filter and those kind of things where it's convenient for them to put them on the motor. So on this one, the oil filter is down here, the fuel filter is up here, and your oil pump out is here. And I've said this a few times over the years, this oil filter when it's mounted on the engine beds and down in the bilge, there's no way to get a bucket underneath it. You'd have to put some sort of flexible membrane. It's pretty tough to get to. Same thing when you unscrew the diesel here, the cup's gonna overflow from these lines that's gonna drain out and that's gonna go all over the motor. So it's, it's not set up for the easiest maintenance, but thankfully with a couple quick and relatively easy modifications, we can make this so it's a snap to do and it's really easy and keeps everything clean, uh, which in the long run is worth a few hours of work and a few hundred bucks for parts. So the first thing we need to do is disassembly and the first step of that is to do some labeling. We've got our in and out on the water on the fuel filter here and we need to replace these hoses because this is going to get moved and these hoses are going to have to get a little bit longer. So we're gonna mark one of these A, one of these B. B goes over here, A goes there. And then everything else is pretty self-explanatory. The oil comes off the bottom of the oil pan, if that makes sense. And the oil filter, there's nothing there other than an oil filter. So with those labeled, I'm gonna take a few pictures just in case the Sharpie gets erased through this process and we can start some disassembly. So, normally <laughs> this filter would be full of oil. When we took that off, you get a bunch coming out, but it seems like they shipped it without being full of oil. Uh, so as you can see, taking that filter off, I can't help but get diesel all over all of this, uh, which in the confined space of the boat, it's going to get pretty stinky. So you want to really try to keep the diesel spillage in the boat to a minimum. So we're going to reuse this same housing for the filter. We are just going to mount it in a much, much, much more convenient place. went to Napa and got some longer hoses. So we need to figure out exactly where the engine sits and then where these are gonna be mounted so that we have the correct length of hose. So what we did for now is we took the fuel line here and we connected one end to the other 
and we just have a loop on there. So after we drop the motor in and get the fuel filter mounted, we can decide where we need to cut this hose. And we're going to do the same thing for the oil. So we've got our oil adapter here, and we've got oil coming in, oil going out, and this is set up so that you can plug two of them, uh, depending on which way this faces. So we've got this, the gasket on there and hand tight. So we're going to be able to turn it, I think, enough to get clearance in here, which means we need to plug these bottom two. Tighten the bypass adapter to the same tightness as your filter. Be sure bypass adapter O-ring makes contact with sealing surface. If there's a gap between the block and the O-ring, the factory oil filter nipple will need to be trimmed. Uh, it seems like that ring is tightened. It's touching. Um, but right now, this lets us make the connections to the engine while the engine's out here and we don't have to worry about guessing or cutting our tubing. We'll just run it over to where it needs to be and cut it, and then we might have a usable piece of tubing left over in the middle. And it's just coiled up and zip tied to the motor for now. We'll drop this in, get these to where they need to go, and then cut them at that point. And that way we can be a little less wasteful with the hose. So the last thing we need to do here before we can drop this back in is hook up the line for um, the pump out out of the oil pan. Fills up. On the back of this panel, Steve installs an oil pump that replaces the manual pump used for oil changes that came with the engine. It's connected to the drain plug in the oil pan, and it can pump out old oil as well as put new oil in. Let's get this in the right orientation. Look at that. All right, down. that for now. Cool, let me set her down. And obviously we don't have a wrench. Well, you do have a wrench. <laughs> okay. Rag please first. There you go. We can get to the point where I can no longer hold the shaft and start starting to snug up. Okay, that's good enough. That's good enough for this operation. Push the shaft up till you get a one inch gap. How well, much you got? One and a half. All right. Good enough. I think that's where you're gonna be. Yep. Kyle, can you tell me how much shaft is sticking out? Yeah. I'm calling it inch and a half, inch and a quarter. Great. That's where we're at. Yeah, it looks 
So there's a bunch of degrees of alignment, right? There's fore and aft, transversely or side to side, and then there's angle. And the longitudinal fore and aft one is the one that doesn't matter that much because the shaft can slide, you know, an inch either direction. The side to side, we have slots in where the engine frame, engine mounting points sit onto the resilient mounts. So we can adjust that to some degree and get some rotation out of that. And then the up and down, we can change the height that, of the nuts on each of the resilient mounts. So we're going to do this and get it as close as we can. Then we're going to put the boat in the water, put the raking on, let it swell. And that's most likely going to change the angular alignment. Yeah. And then we'll just have to jack the engine up around a little bit. Well, the, the whole bit length of the hull is going to move yeah. a little. Yeah. So we just want to get this into a position where we have enough range of motion in our bolt alignment mm -hmm. so that we can adjust it again after, after it's in the water and then after a couple of weeks in the water. Joe's smart. He's got the sh long undershirt tucked in so he can't show the plumber's crap. Kyle, you could learn something. <laughs> Uh, you got about another eight inches to go down. Kyle, you're gonna have to start pulling forward in the boat more. Forward, yeah. How's that? That's pretty good. Um. More. Yep. You actually hit both of them? Yep. I'm good at what I do, Joe. I know that. Oh, it may hit the hose. Yeah. It may have to shorten the bolt. Yeah. Not a time to go further this way. Okay. But, but that's it okay. looks like we're we're not going that way. We're gonna go this right. way. Yeah, pretty great. Okay, you're pretty much free. Pull it from the front? Yeah, you could. Actually, here's what you do. Stand up. Look at the other alternator. It'll help you out. <laughs> now you're going to need, I think, a 14 millimeter for that nut down below. Or you can use my metric adjustable. <laughs> how do I, how the hell am I going to get a wrench on that? Well, you wanted to learn. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounded like click and, <laughs> click and clack. Hi, I'm Fred Knowles. Um, I own Hanson Marine Engineering in Marblehead, and we're the nanny dealer for the New England area. And we're out here today to make sure that this unit gets installed correctly so that it will be trouble free. Let me just make sure that there's nothing pouring out of the engine that it shouldn't be. And I don't see anything in the bilge, so that hose that was put on here appears to be okay. Are you ready? Yep. Fuel came out though. Don't worry about it. I'm not. Oh, It'll come eventually. That sounded great. <laughs> yes, it did. Woohoo! Yes, oh, yeah. yes, it did. Sounded very good. We've hooked up an external oil filter, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that the plumbing is accurate. 
Absolutely. Okay, so I'm gonna get up here. So I get out of the smoke line. Okay, we got uh, we got 60 pounds of oil pressure. That tells me that we have accurate oil rooting. All right. Clean up. Well, there you go. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, you got. That's awesome. You got a running machine now. You got a running machine. So when the gentleman from D'Angelo gets here, he'll bolt this all together, and uh, you'll see if it works. <laughs> well, it worked today, so. Yeah. It's kind of wild to be at the point in the project where people are asking what I'm going to do with the tools and the equipment and all of that and people being uh, kind of sad that the, the project as they see it is kind of ending and I uh, want to reassure folks that that's not really the case at all. If you look around you know, there's no way on earth that we're going to get everything finished, totally buttoned up before we launch. And that was never really the goal. Since I haven't sailed and I haven't lived aboard a boat for a long period of time, I don't exactly know how we're going to want things uh, in the interior. So I'm purposefully leaving a lot of stuff undone on the deck, down below, until we can live with the boat and sail it a little bit and kind of decide... I know how exactly we want things, where we want to store things. So there's going to be after launch, I know my guess would be about another year's worth of working, tweaking, adjusting things on the boat. We got to finish up locker space. We got to finish up a lot in the interior. We're going to have to shake down the rig. Um, I'm sure that there's going to be stuff that we're going to add, subtract, change through that whole process. We've got to mount solar panels. Uh, weather vane, uh, the hydro generator, uh, we got to do all the nav gears, got to go up on the spars and get all installed. So don't, don't worry, don't fear that, that this is all over and the boat's going to launch and the channel's going to shut down and there's not going to be uh, any more Friday videos. They're going to keep coming, there's going to be a lot of woodworking and problem solving and we're going to slowly transition that into doing more adventures and doing more sailing and we hope that you stick around and continue to support and continue to follow us through that journey. And I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to the, to the next stages. This has been, this has been a long haul and uh, I'm very happy to have done it. Very honored to have been able to, to do this and very touched by all the, the support and the amazing people that, that have come and chipped in and made this happen. But I personally am really looking forward to a change of scenery and a little bit different change in pace. And uh, I think being on the water will, will be a great change and will be very refreshing. It's been, you know, seven years of slogging away here in the boatyard and working every day towards the boat. And uh, it's going to be amazing to, to launch here and just, just have that change a little bit. Um, so fear not, Acorn to Arabella will continue. And there is plenty more building and tweaking and all sorts of stuff to come.